Sunday night, we are in the book of Revelation. This is in excess of 200 Sunday nights that we've been in this book. We've been, we've been studying the book of Revelation for 200 and something weeks. Uh, most people can't last for a Sunday in it because they don't understand that these pictures in the book of Revelation... They are actually pointers. I like the first verse of the book. When you look at the first verse, there's two verses in the book that if you understand, you're going to understand the book. Now, of course, the word revelation, I put this on the board nearly every week. Some weeks I don't. But I put it up here to help people that haven't heard this before. Revelation is the word apocalypsis. Apocalypsis, that is, we, we say apocalypse. When we think of apocalypse, we think of something hazy and smoky and, and kind of ominous and scary and, and some horsemen are coming out of the, the smoke and here they come riding and this is a white horse and a red horse and a, and a black horse and a pale horse and we think of, ooh, something scary. Well, that's not what the word apocalypse means. In fact, apocalypse means the exact opposite of that. That hazy smokiness. Apocalypse means to remove all the smokiness, remove all the haze. So you can see it clearly. That's what the word apocalypse means. It comes from apo and calypto. Apo means a removal and calypto means cover. It means a removal of a cover. So if you've got smoky and haziness covering something, it's to remove all of that. It is to see something clear. It's to see clearly. That's actually what the word revelation means. It means to see clearly. I've said this before. In the Greek text, the word revelation has basically the same meaning as the word truth has the basic same meaning. The word revelation means the same thing as truth. Because revelation means to take off the cover. And truth is the word A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. Aletheia. And aletheia, the Greek word truth in the original Greek text. This word truth comes from the word lanthano. Lanthano means to conceal or to lie hid. Now, when you place the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet in front of a word as a negative particle, it negates the word and gives an opposite meaning. Placing the alpha in front of lanthano translates aletheia, and it means not to hide anything. Well, when you don't hide something, you take the cover off, don't you? So revelation and truth mean basically the same thing. So whatever God's going to reveal himself to his predestinated elect family. God's got an elect family that he will reveal himself to, and he will cause them to see and hear the truth. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. The two verses that you really need to understand as much as anything else is verse 1 of Revelation, the first chapter, and verse 20 of Revelation, the first chapter. Verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ. Not many revelations, but the. The is a definite article. The, being a definite article, says there is one revelation of Jesus Christ. And this revelation is to God's church. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The servants of God are to have these things made known unto them. We are all servants of Christ, all of the elect, all of God's children, not everybody in the world. This book was not meant for people 
who are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. It was not meant for them to understand. Which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it. Signified what? Signified the things that must shortly come to pass, and the revelation. He signified the revelation by his angel unto his servant John. Now the word signify is the word simiao, S-E-M-E-I-O-O, simiao. It comes from the word simeon, S-E-M-E-I-O-N. That word simeon means a sign. This means a sign, a beacon, or a pointer. Now what this book is about, it uses all kinds of of idioms and metaphors. It uses all kinds of cultural idiomatic language in the first century to point to something. All of these things, the scorpions. The scorpions. Uh, when you get, that's an idiom. That means a false teacher. Uh, when you get into the, to the vials and the seals. The seals, or you see the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail on this because I've gone through it. The four horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation, the sixth chapter, that is the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. That's what it is. The first horse is a white horse, and the man has a sword. The second horse is a red horse. Excuse me, the first horse is a white horse, and he has a bow. Always the men who were head of an empire rode white horses. The second horse is a red horse and he has a sword. Has a sword. The third horse is a black horse and he's got scales. He's showing a famine. He says three measures of barley for a penny and a measure of wheat for a penny. I'm not going to go into that. I've gone into that already. And that shows famine. And then the fourth horse, death and plague and pestilence ride with him and that's the third judgment of God and the fourth judgment's the beast and that's the one on the white horse at the at the first uh, the first horse that comes out this is the this is the forever judgments of God all through the Old Testament the sword the famine the pestilence and the beast those horses those horsemen they are signs they are simia S-E-M-E-I-O-O. They are signs. They are beacons. They are pointers. When you see the first horse, let's just say, when you see this, the first judgment of God was the famine. When you see the horse, the black horse, see the black horse, I, I want to show you this. I want you to realize this and get this in your head. Because this is what Revelation is about. You see the black horse and the man and the man on the black horse, he's got these scales in his hand, and it's it's pointing to famine. It's not talking about a literal horse of any kind. It's talking about the black horse is a, is a metaphor for famine. It points to famine. That's what it does. You have to learn to get these various things in mind when you see the scorpions. You see a scorpion. We've already said in Revelation, the ninth chapter, a scorpion, that's a simiao. That's a simiao. When he says, I'm going to give, I'm going to signify. The word signify, you see that in the first verse. He says, he sent and signified it by his angels. Look at the word signify. S-I-G-N. Sign. When you're riding down the road, and you see... And you say, honey, I got to go get some tires for the car. You tell your wife. So you take off down the road and you look and you see, you see 
drugstore. Oh, there's where I go buy tires. N no. You go on down the road till you see department store, Kmart. Well, you might buy tires there. If you're like me, you'll wait till you get to Firestone, Goodyear. That's it. Those are signs that point to what's inside the building. Now, if everyone knew where everything was, we wouldn't need a semi-o. Now, God says, I'm going to reveal these things to my people. When you see a scorpion, you have to define scorpion. And the way you find out what a scorpion is, you define it. Scorp uh, the word is scorpios, S-K-O-R-P-I-O-S. And you have a verb form of scorpion, and that is S-K-O-R-P-I-Z-O. You always have nouns. That's a person, place, or thing. And then you have a verb form of it. Well, the verb form that shows action, that is the word scorpizo. And scorpizo means to scatter abroad. Now, when the Lord said, when Jesus said, the hireling, the man who works for money and he preaches for money, he cares not for the sheep. He allows the wolf to come in and scatter the flock. Well, the scorpion is a false teacher. Wolves are false teachers. Jesus said so in Matthew, the seventh chapter. So a scorpion, scorpion, I'm kind of putting it this way. Let me put it like this. You're riding down the road and you want to find Baptist Church. It's got a sign out there and it says Scorpion. <laughs> scorpion Pastor. Right? That is a sign that tells you that inside that church building that there is a false teacher. That's a pointer that points to the false teacher. I'm using that as a joke. But that's a pointer that points to the false teacher that's inside that church. Scorpion is a pointer to false teachers. That's what it is. So when the Bible says there that he, he will signify these things, you have to define everything in the book to find out what it's pointing at. Everything in Revelation is a pointer. Pointing at something. Just like the sign out here, gas, food. We used to travel, I used to travel in the music business, and we'd get real hungry after a show, and I'd be we'd looking for some place to eat, and we didn't care. We wasn't looking for a gourmet restaurant, and we'd see in the distance the truck stop, and say, food, he'd say, there's one right there. We didn't care. That, that was the sign. But we weren't interested in the sign. We were interested in the sign pointing to what was inside that building. We didn't go up there and start chewing on the sign. You understand what I'm saying? Everything in Revelation is pointers. Now, the way you find out what it means, you define everything, don't you? So, when we're going through this, and we're talking about, I'm not going to go into all of it. I've already done it. I've got too many things to say on the ten horns. And the ten horns are a sign. That's what they are. When you, you go into, let me erase some of this. Now, we've been talking about the ten horns of the beast. The ten horns of the beast. I, I haven't made it this simple. Sometimes people say, well, I already got all that down. Let me really explain it simple so you can understand. You say, Jim, we're not a bunch of elementary children. Yes, you are. <laughs> what do you mean you're not? Certainly you are. If you haven't learned it before, it don't matter if you're 70 years old. It doesn't matter. When I say beast, you say beast in the 20th century, what does it mean? Well, it's some really roaring lion, some lion out here at the zoo, or a bear, or a, or a leopard, or a jaguar, 
or a, or a polar bear or a, uh, that's a beast, something that'll kill you and eat you up. Ravenous animal. Yes, anything that's ravenous. Well, it does mean to devour, but it does not mean what we think of when we say beast. Because we see the beast rising up out of the sea. The beast is a simiao. It is a sign. When the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, give us a sign. What's amazing, the Jews got signs over in the Old Testament, didn't they? Here's a sign. Here's a simiao right here. Here's a picture of a simiao. When you've got that fire right out your front door right there, and you're living in a tent right about there, you think that's a semi-o? You think that's a sign? There's a God out my front door. He's in a fire out there. Well, that's a sign, isn't it? They got a fire by night, and they got another sign. When the fire started moving, well, they usually didn't move at night. It became a cloud in the daytime. It was a fire at night. And during the day, when that cloud started moving, everybody said, pack up, let's get going, God's moving. That was God's sign to pack everything up and get going because the cloud was moving. And another sign, sign pointed to something. The sign that they were following God, they were in the desert for 40 years in heat, 120, 30 35 degrees heat, and nobody's feet ever swelled up in the desert. Was that a sign? Yeah, that a sign. Ooh, we, I guess so. And their shoes never wore out. They started on their journey at the beginning of the 40 years in the wilderness when they left, when they left Sinai. They go up to Kadesh Barnea. They don't do the will of God by going in and conquer the Anakims. So God says you've got to wander 40 years in the wilderness. And they wander 40 years. And they got their sandals on their feet. And their shoes never wear out. I think that's a semi-io, isn't it? That's a sign. You have to understand the Jews sought a sign. Well, the Jews got signs. But Jesus said in Matthew 16, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a Simeon, and there will no Simeon be given to the Jewish generation, this adulterous generation, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. The literal Jews, because they turned away from God, get no more Simeons. But we are spiritual Jews in Revelation We're Jews of the heart. We've been circumcised of the heart. And we get all these semi-ios. We get all of these. We get these locusts, which are false teachers. We get all of these pictures. We get pictures of, we get a beast. What I'm trying, I'm trying to get you to understand something. You think you've got this down? You don't really Because everything in Revelation you don't understand is a sign and you're going to have to define it. We're going to have to go to the Old Testament and find out. You say, well, how do you know that about scorpions? Well, you define, you get the verb form of scorpion, scorpizo. And then you go to the Old Testament in Ezekiel, the second chapter. And the Lord tells Ezekiel, Ezekiel, you've been carried away into the captivity. You're in Babylon now. You dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words. Scorpions are a them. It is a people. It is false teachers. It's a sign. And so is the smoke from the bottomless pit, from the pit. I said this to people at the house the other night. I said, I have brought this up, and I think everybody's missed this because I've never had one person comment to me on it. I brought out what the scorpions are. I brought out the bottomless pit. Bottomless pit is a terrible translation. It's, it's wrong. Bottomless pit is not the word. That is, a, that is so bad of translation. Bottomless pit... I want to show you, I'm going to bring this out 
Because this is of utmost importance. Bottomless pit. I want to show you this in Paul's writings. I'm trying to get... Let me tell you something. I think about this stuff day and night. I've spent 51 years studying Bible... And my mind never gets out of this. Me and Mary riding down the road and she'll be talking. All I can hear is wah, 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 wah over there. And I am, and she's saying, you're not listening to me. I, I, Mary, I'm thinking. You know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about the beast and the horns and the pit and the, and the uh, 70 weeks of Daniel, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And I'm thinking of Baal and the grove and I'm thinking and all this stuff is going through my head. I'm, and I'm going down the road and we're headed down Gallatin Road and she's talking and I'm just thinking all these things and and I don't even think she knows how much this is going on in my head constantly. I can't get away from it. It just, my brain won't stop running. If you'll cram your brain full of information for 50 years, you'll get to be going, Phew, and you won't quit thinking about it. And I feel like that I don't, I'm constantly saying, Lord, how can I show these people these things in the Scripture? And let me show you something that's just utterly amazing. Bottomless pit and scorpion. I'm going to show you this. Because I've said it and I think people have actually missed it. And I'm going to show you where Paul brings this out in his writings. Go back to Revelation 9. I didn't mean to do this, but I want to clarify this. Revelation 9. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. What is that star? Huh? No, no. What's the star? You're guessing. Don't guess. If you hadn't been here, you won't know. No, 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 no. You're not thinking. Y'all are just like staggering around in the dark. Go back to chapter 1. Chapter 1. Huh? Thank you, Jim. Jim's thinking. Go back to chapter 1. Jesus is standing in the midst of the candlesticks in verse 11 and 12 and 13. Verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. Oh, goodness, where is that going to take us? Seven stars. Seven stars. What are the seven stars? Huh? Well, yes, but what are the original seven stars? Pleiades. And what was the seven stars called? It was called one. It was called Pleiades. And what's another name for Pleiades? Morning star. That was the morning star that came out in the spring. Do you think these are signs? Certainly they're signs. The morning star was the Pleiades. Remember, the rabbis said that the Pleiades, the morning star in the spring, called the, caused the blossoms to come out on the tree and on the crops to come up and caused fertility to come and resurrect in the spring. We talked about that this morning, didn't we? The rabbis said, whoever had the morning star had crops in the spring. Well, there's a spiritual morning star, and what's that? Huh? <laughs> Somebody said it out there. Who is the morning star? Jesus! <laughs> Jesus is the morning star, isn't he? Well, if we have Jesus the morning star, we have spiritual crops, and what is that? Fruit of the Spirit. That's what we have. And the man that overcomes gets the morning star in the second chapter of Revelation. 
But let's get off of that and get back to the seven stars. And of course, the, the evening star was Orion. And the rabbi says that Orion took the sap down in the spring. And the Lord tells Job, Job, I can bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and I can loose the bands of Orion. Well, binding the sweet influences of Pleiades, that was stopping the crops from coming. That was stopping the apple blossoms from blossoming out. Because the rabbi said, as to whether it actually happened or not, is neither here nor there. But the rabbi said that the Pleiades brought out the blossoms. The sweet influences of Pleiades in Job the 38th chapter is not... The Pleiades is affecting your life and it has, and your moon is coming up out of the second quarter and it's rising in Saturn and no. Sweet influences of Pleiades would be the smell of the apple blossoms. The rabbi said Pleiades, the seven stars, brought the crops in the spring. And that the evening star in the winter, Orion, took the sap down and stopped the crops from growing. God says, I can bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and bring famine. When he says that, it's not whether the Pleiades actually did that. That's what the rabbi said. So God says, I'll use your cultural customs and tell you I can bind Pleiades and starve you to death. And he says also, I can loose the bands of Orion. He means that when the sap goes down in the winter, Orion has bound the sap into the ground. God says, I'll bring a warm front and I'll loose Orion in January for about two or three weeks and make the crocuses bloom, make the daffodils come out and I'll hit you with a freeze and I'll kill your crops. God's done that up several times in the last few years in America. That's why we don't have any tangerine juice this year. And that's why my favorite honey tangelos, I can't get them this year. So all of these are signs. You have to understand what the Jewish culture said something was. And, and don't forget this. So when you... Seven stars in the right hand of Christ. What was the right hand? hand of authority. Anytime something was in the right hand, that's the hand of authority. And then we look down here in verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. Here is a glossary for the book. Glossary comes from glossa. That's a Greek word that means foreign language. Now, here's a glossary. Here it is. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. Seven stars equals the seven angels of the seven churches. Well, when you get to Revelation, the eighth chapter, eight, nine, and ten... You've got in Revelation 8, 9, and 10, you've got seven angels, don't you? With seven trumpets. These are the same seven angels that are the seven stars. So you can equate the seven angels with the seven stars, can't you? The seven angels are the seven stars. Well, he said in the word angel, angelos. Messenger. So the seven stars are the seven messengers of the seven churches. All of the pastors of the churches were called angels or angelos. Angel is the common Greek word messenger. That's all it means. It don't mean some heavily being... I saw an angel the other night came in my bedroom. Was it Billy Graham or was it me? No, it couldn't have been Billy Graham because he's not a messenger. He don't tell the truth. Must have been Jim Brown by my bed the other night. Yeah, I snuck in your house and said, I'm an angel, I'm here. Uh, predestination's true. Yeah, predestination's true. Okay, I whispered that in your ear. All right. So, and you got seven angels with seven trumpets, and ten and seven 
the last trumpet sounds, and we're going to be changed at the last trump, aren't we? <laughs> There's no pre-trip rapture. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twink of an eye at the last trump. At the seventh trump, when the seventh trumpet sounds, Christ puts one foot on the land, the other on the sea, and time is no more. I'm sorry, but the, there ain't no pre-trib rapture. That's a lie. That's one of the biggest lies that's been hatched. Now, I'm trying to point out something to you. I'm talking about everything in Revelation is a simeon. It's a pointer. Everything in Revelation points to something that is a reality. But don't look at... If the, if the scorpions are literal, they're not helicopters. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. The scorpions are false teachers. The scorpions are figurative language to point at false teachers. Now, now let's back up. Well, let's, let me finish reading that. And the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Well, the seven stars or the angels, or the message inside the refined church. That's the oil inside the candlesticks that makes the light burn. And we are the candlesticks. We're the refined church. We have been refined. And we're the light. The oil in us is a picture of the stars, or the angel, or the message. Stars are equal to message, aren't they? If stars are equal to message, stars are equal to the oil that's inside the candlestick and the oil in us. In the Old Testament, they, were, they anointed the priest and the king with oil. We're anointed with the Holy Spirit. This is a picture of the Holy Spirit of the truth that's in us. The Holy Spirit's truth. So when we preach and we speak, that's the message coming out of our mouth. Let me put it this way. That's the star coming out of our mouth to the earth. It's the judgment of God. Back up over here to what we were just reading about the scorpions. Back up over here to Revelation 9. Back up to Revelation 8. I saw these seven angels. What are the seven angels? Jim keeps saying, giving the answers. He's an old, he's an old guy. He knows by now to say it like it is. <laughs> The seven angels are the seven stars, aren't they? The seven stars are the seven angels. The seven angels are the seven stars, seven stars, seven angels, seven angels, seven stars, seven stars, seven, stars, seven angels. Get, get that together. When you see seven angels, anytime you see one of these angels step forward, it's one of the stars. But the angel is the message. So that has to be what's coming out of our mouth. When the stars fall to earth, it's the message coming from our mouth. Well, look here. They all start sounding. The first angel sounds in verse 7 of chapter 8. Second angel sounds in verse 8. Verse 10, the third angel sounds, and there fell a great star from heaven. What kind of star is that? Well, first of all, what's the heavens? <laughs> heavens was a term for Israel. And what's that now? That's us, isn't it? That's us. Now, if you've been here, you've heard all of this. I'm trying to give you a little bit of uh, quiz. See if you remember some of this stuff. There fell a great star from heaven. An angel sounds and a star falls. And the stars are the angels. Isn't that what the first chapter says? The stars are the angels. The angels are the stars. The angel sounds and a star falls. It's kind of like, I'm sounding out. And here comes a star. Huh? So the angel is the well, it is the message out of the messenger. How many, candle, how many candlesticks are there? The word is not candlestick, it's menorah. Let me put this way. How many lamps are there? One. It's got seven arms. There's one church. Seven means refinement. When you see the seven stars or the seven... Seven stars or seven angels. It means the refined message inside the church. It's the oil inside the lamp. Can you see that? 
So when the angel sounds, when the angel sounds, it's kind of like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's a good, that's a good analogy. It's like the lighting up of the candle, giving out the light. And we're the light, aren't we? And this is the church, isn't it? This is the refined church. That's what it is. What we're talking about is Simeon, signs, pointers. If you don't define, don't listen to Hal Lindsey when he says, these are scorpions or helicopters. The guy's an ignoramus. Well, but wait a minute. He's refining us, isn't he? We're not talking about the Baptist church. We're not talking about the church of Christ. We're not talking about the Pentecostal church. We're talking about the refined church. That ain't got nothing to do with those guys down the street. That's in us. That's right. Well, I'm not talking about Billy Graham. He's not refined. I'm not talking about Charles Stanley. That ain't the church. Those aren't preachers. They're false teachers. They're scorpions. They don't talk about daily cross, death to self, self self-denial, dying daily. You have to be hated for telling the truth. They don't talk about that. So that's false doctrine that they teach. We're talking about the refined church. All these are pointers you have to define. And once you define the seven stars are the seven messengers, there were more than seven churches in Asia. There were many more than seven churches in Asia. You had the church at Troas up here. You had the church at Colossia. You had the church at Miletus. You had them all over Asia. Seven is merely a number that God puts into the Scripture. It's a number of refinement. Remember the word seven is the word Sheba. In the Hebrew, it comes from the word Shaba. Shaba is a word that means to take an oath to God. It means to complete or perfect... Or it means, this word Shabbat means to seven oneself. That's what it means. So when you see the seven candlesticks are the seven churches, think of it this way. The seven candlesticks are the sevened church. Seven is a number that is a pointer. Anytime you see seven, what it does, here's what seven does. Seven is a pointer. Perfection or completion. It points to being completed in Christ. That's what it means. In fact, Peter says, 2 Peter 1 and 5 He says, besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith. Add to your faith. Add is a command. It is an imperative command. And you have to add if you're a believer. Somewhere in your life, you're going to add. And he names seven things to add. But these seven things takes a lifetime. It's a lifetime of adding. I want to point, I want to show you something. Back over here in Revelation 9, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Revelation 9, and to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. It's amazing. Because this is an angel where a star, the message of God, falls to the earth. And this angel, who is this angel? Stop and think. It's one of those seven angels, isn't it? Isn't that the refined message of God? The refined message of God has the key to the bottomless pit. Key to the bottomless pit. Now. All right, hold on. I want you to see these signs without defining People say, where do you find all your answers? Man, I go into encyclopedias of all kinds. I go into culture books of the Jews. 
most of the answers for revelation are found in the Old Testament. That's where they're found. You simply take every enigm- enigmatic word in the book of Revelation and define what it actually meant to the Jews. You say, that don't make any sense to me. Well, we've had lots of idioms in our life. What if we used to say, boy, that girl is a dog. We don't mean that she was a collie or that she was a bulldog or that she was a... We meant she was ugly. When we used the word dog back in when I was a teenager, dog was a pointer, it meant ugly. How, what other kind of idioms do we have? Well, that guy is slick. Slick didn't mean he had grease all over him. Slick was a pointer. It meant crooked. Sleazy. Watch out for him. He'll get you. Now, these are some words that we had. What did the teenagers use today? You walk up to somebody and you say, What's happening, man? First of all, you don't mean that they're a man, do you? Hey, man. Uh, kids say that to each other and they're 15. And that don't mean either one of them's a man. And they don't mean what's happening. They don't mean actually what is going on in the world right now. All oh, the sun's shining and the moon uh, is going to come out in just a little bit. The sun's about to go down and, and it's 7 o'clock and there's a car over there. That's not what they mean. You say, well, why don't they say it that way? Why don't we say it that way? Why don't we come up and say, that guy's a crook. Well, gosh, I think crook comes from a Greek word that means forward, doesn't it? So everything we say is idiomatic language. These are idioms and metaphors all the way through the book. You have to define what it means. It's a pointer. Can we understand that? So when you see something defined once in Revelation, it does not change anywhere else. You find... Now, you got two sets of angels. You got a set of four, and you got a set of seven. But the set of four is also called four beasts, but don't confuse that. Don't confuse that with the beast, with the beast of Revelation, because this is a good beast. And you got two beasts in Revelation 13. You got the beast that's like a lion, a bear, and a leopard, and that's a world ruling system. And then you got the second beast that speaks like a dragon and it has two horns like a lamb. It looks like Jesus, but it's a smooth talker. That's not those beasts. You got to keep the beasts separated. You got four beasts or four angels, and always they'll come together. And it, and it will say over in the 15th chapter, or in the 17 and 1, it'll say, And one of the seven angels came to John. Well, what does it mean, seven angels? One of the seven stars in the right hand of Jesus, that is the seven angels of the seven churches, come to John and say to him. When you see one of the original seven angels, it's still the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, isn't it? This is really elementary and it's very basic. Don't get away from the original definitions. You understand what I'm saying? Don't leave the original definitions. Bottomless pit is one of the worst translations. Let me show you something here. And I think everybody's missed it. We've gone through so much of this. I didn't even mean to get into this tonight. You cannot understand the book of Revelation without defining what these pointers are. You understand what I'm saying? Y'all really understand this. Without understanding the pointers. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm fixing to show you what the bottomless pit is. No, I ain't got nothing to do with that. No. No, I'm fixing to show you what the bottomless pit is. No. Bottomless pit has a definition. 
you got to define the word. Bottomless pit. Bottomless pit is the word A B U S S O S. Abusas. We use the word A B Y S S. Abyss. Now, when we think of an abyss, we think of you go out to some great ominous looking hole. You can go out to one of these, you can go to Africa or down in South America and come up and go through the jungles and you can come to some, and I've seen pictures of them, the great deep holes go way down into the, into the earth and, and it goes down for a mile and you can't see the bottom and it just, and it's dark and there's a fog there and it looks like it's bottomless and it looks like an abyss. That's not what this word bottomless pit means. That is not what it means at all. The word bottomless pit comes from the word bathos or the word bathizo, B-A-T-H-I-Z-O. And bathizo means a place of knowledge or intellectual depth. That's what it means. Something with great understanding and intellectual depth. That word bathizo is the same word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. 2. This is amazing because he uses the word revealed, which is, which is a, comes from the word revelation. Look here in verse 9. But, it is, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed, apocalypto, apocalypto means to take off the cover. Hold on. Comes from apo and calypto, removal of the cover. God hath, and from revealed we get the word apocalypse, which is the word revelation. God hath revealed them unto us, the elect. Chapter 2, verse 10. He has revealed them to us by His Spirit. Wait a minute. Revealed means to take off the cover by His Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the truth. And truth means not to hide anything. He has revealed, taken off the cover by His truth, by not hiding anything from us. And then He says, For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. That word deep is the word bathidzo. Now when you bathidzo means a place of great knowledge and understanding. When you take the alpha, first letter of the Greek alphabet, when it's used as a negative particle, for those of you that haven't heard this, negative particle, it negates a word by placing it in front of it. It's called the alpha privative P-R-I-V-A-T-I-V-E. When you place it in front of a word as a negative particle to negate the word, it's called the alpha, the alpha privative. It negates the word and gives an opposite meaning. When you place the alpha in front of bathizo or in front of bathos, it translates abusos. It means a place of no intellectual knowledge or understanding. It means to know nothing. Well, that's what the scorpions, they're coming up 
these locusts who are like scorpions are coming up out of the bottomless pit, aren't they? They're coming out of a place of no knowledge and they don't know anything. Scorpion, scorpidzo. Comes from scor- it, That is the verb form of scorpios. Now these, this is, these are pointers. It's what it is. God is using terminology and he's going to reveal it to us because we're going to define these things and he's going to say, here's what I'm pointing at. Jesus said the hireling there in John 10 does not care for the sheep. He allows the wolf to come in and scatter the flock. Scatters the verb form of scorpion. Scorpions are false teachers. If you go to the Middle East and you ask, hey, what's a real slick talking camel salesman around here? A guy that'll sell you an old broken down camel and get high price for it and won't even give you good terms on it. So we call him a scorpion around here. What do you call him in America? Oh, we call him a snake in the grass. We don't mean a guy's actually a snake in the grass crawling around there, do we? No, but he is a snake in the grass, isn't he? If we've got a terminology that equates with their terminology, why can't we accept the fact that they've got one called scorpions? They live in a desert. Why wouldn't they call it a scorpion? Why wouldn't scorpions come into their idiomatic language somewhere? You dwell among scorpions, Ezekiel. Don't pay any attention to their words. So abusos means a place of no knowledge. Well, do false teachers know anything? No, absolutely not. They do not. They don't define anything. They just rattle and they say fly words. And we, oh, we love God this morning. And we love being here with you here. And, and isn't it wonderful? The grass is green and the birds are singing. And we just love the Lord. And God loves everyone in the world. And they get generalized and mush and say nothing. And define nothing. And nobody knows what anything means. And everybody's comfortable. And they leave the church. And they're bored out of their minds. They know nothing, do they? They know nothing. Scorpions are false teachers that know nothing. Isn't that right? Let me show you something in the book of 1 Timothy. False teachers are scorpions, right? And know nothing is the bottomless pit, isn't it? Turn over here to first. I, this is the part that I've given to you. And I've thrown it at you before. And everybody seems to miss it every time I mention it. Not everybody. Not everybody. But a few of you. I've said this. And I hadn't anybody comment on it. When you go over here to first Timothy is one of my six chapters. One of my favorite chapters on false teachers. 1 Timothy 6. In the 6th chapter of 1 Timothy, you're going to see the bottomless pit. And you're going to see the scorpions. If you see the scorpions, the word scorpion is not going to be in the 6th chapter. But if the word scorpion is not there, what's going to be there? A false teacher is going to be there. And if he doesn't, and if you, if you can't see the word bottomless pit there, you're going to have to get a synonym for bottomless pit there. You're going to see no nothing because that's what the word bottomless pit means. Look at it right here. Verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine Be not blasphemed. Now, he's fixing to start talking about false teachers because doctrine is the word didache. Blasphemed is the word blasphemos. Doctrine is the word instruction. That's the word didache. Blasphemos comes from blapto, meaning to hinder... And feme, P-H-E-M-E, feme, 
That is our word, fame, to hinder the fame of God and make Him infamous. And the word infamous is the word reproach. Blessed are ye when men shall reproach you and make you infamous. That's the word O-N-E-I-D-I-Z-O. Oniedzo. It means to be infamous. Well, from feme, we get the word feme, P-H-E-M-I, and that means a word said. The people who hinder the word of God or his instructions, these are false teachers, aren't they? Now, we're fixing to talk about false teachers, and I want to show you how Paul mentions scorpions and the bottomless pit. In, I want you to be aware when you read and you're examining Scripture, Pay real close attention when you're seeing something and remember all the definitions that you have before that you've learned throughout the Scripture. When I'm studying, I let my mind flow freely. I don't mean I latch down on anything. I let everything, if I run into sevens, I let them flow through there. I let them flow through. I don't stop. So, well, that don't have nothing to do with that. I, I won't let that flow through. It's kind of like algebra. When you're in algebra, if you stuff all these axioms and theorems and postulates in your mind, and you're thinking algebra, a lot of times you're just thinking it, it's going click, click, click. If you let this information flow in your mind, don't conclude anything. Just let it flow. From time to time, things will go click. Have y'all noticed that when you study under me? And you get all this information, and somebody will come to me and say, Jim, you've been saying this. I've heard you say this 500 times, and I did not understand it till this morning. I've had people come to me after three and four years and say, I just got it. Man, this is fantastic. I'm going, I kept trying to tell you, but you can't tell somebody until it clicks. When you think you understand everything I'm teaching, you don't. Because I don't understand everything. Yes, it is. It's like a puzzle. Without defining everything you can define. That's why, if you think you've heard everything I'm teaching and you've been here five years, you haven't even begun to hear everything I teach. You had not even heard everything that's going on in my mind. I've been putting puzzles together for decades. 20, 30, 40 years. I've, I realized when I discovered, and a guy quoted Romans eight twenty nine. for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. When God showed me that predestination, the sovereignty of God was true, and I learned that in 1961, from that day forward, I have been studying the Bible from a mathematical viewpoint, and everything has to mathematically synthesize together. That's what's wrong with these preachers. They're imbeciles. They can't think. They can't define. They can't count. Thank you. <laughs> they can't, can they? They can't count. <laughs> but let me show you this. I want to show you that Paul mentions the bottomless pit and the scorpions without saying that term. Look here. He goes on to say, verse 2, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise. Now, if a man teaches otherwise, he's going to be a false teacher, isn't he? Is he going to be a scorpion? Yes. He's going to be a scorpion. Now, otherwise is the word hetero. H-E-T-E-R-O. D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-E-O. Didaskalia. D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-I-A. That's another word for instruction or doctrine. And hetero means other. We say heterosexual. That means other sex. Hetero means other doctrine, other instruction. A man that preaches another instruction is a false teacher, isn't he? He's a scorpion, isn't he? All right, I want to show you that Paul actually mentions the bottomless pit here 
And he mentions the scorpions without using that terminology, but he uses it by definition. He says, if any man teaches otherwise and consents not to wholesome words, hugiano, H-U-G-I-A-I-N-O, that means uncorrupt word. Same word that John used in 3 John 2. I would that you'd prosper and be in health. Health is not the word physical health. That's not the word. Kenneth Copeland, you idiot. Health is the word hugiano. It means uncorrupt word. And prosper is not our word prosper. I'm going to say it again. Prosper is the word E-U. O-D-O-O. That's the word prosper. It comes from the word you and the word hodos. You means well. Hodos means way, road, journey. And Jesus said, I am the hodos. (coughs) The well hodos is Jesus. It's not money. And there's two ways. A narrow way and a broad way. And few find the narrow way and many find the broad way. So when John is wishing for guys, the well way, he's talking about the better of two ways. The narrow way as opposed to the broad way. Define the word narrow, T-H-L-I-B-O. That's the common word for affliction or tribulation from one end of the New Testament to the other. Has nothing to do with money or physical health. Those guys are liars. When I say Benny Hinn is a liar, I mean he's a liar. When I say Kenneth Copeland's a liar, he's oppressing the poor by sucking the life out of him, saying, God wants you to prosper and be in health. One thing I never did understand, God wants me to prosper and be in health, so I need to send you my money so I can prosper and be in health. What do you have to do with God prospering me, me sending you money? Where does the Bible say, I send you money and I'll prosper? Where does it say that? It doesn't even say that I'll have the well way, which is the narrow way, if I send you anything. What do you have to do? What do I have to do with you, Kenneth Copeland, in order to prosper? (coughs) Guys are jerks. They're thieves and liars and crooks, and they're going to hell one day, and they're false teachers. They are scorpions. A man that will twist the Word of God, that's froward when you twist the Word of God, isn't it? You twist prosper into money, and you twist health into physical health when it means the well way, which is Christ, and it's narrow, and it's tribulation, and that you will be accompanied by the uncorrupted Word of God. That's what prosper and being health means. You bunch of idiots, and I'm looking at the camera. Boy, they, you say, Jim, why do you get so mad at them? There's some little lady down here in Charlotte Avenue. And she ain't got no money. And she's got a screen on her back door. And she's got a little old stove in her, in her bedroom. She has to move it to the kitchen to stay warm. She has no money. And these guys are sucking the life out of her and telling her, if you'll send us your last nickel, your electric bill, that money you're going to pay your electric bill with, God will make you prosper. And she goes out and digs and tries and she, and she has no money. She has nothing to pay her bills with. And they're sucking her to death. Does that make you mad? Yes. That infuriates me. I'd like to pop all of them in the mouth for hurting that little old lady. That enrages me. Let me, tell you, let me give you a message, Kenneth Copeland. I hope you're seeing this someday. Or Fred Price or Creflo Dollar. Creflo Nickel or, or T.D. Jakes. Let me tell you guys something. Let me tell you, and I'm pointing right in the camera. I'm going to tell you something. In Exodus, the 22nd chapter, let me tell you what God said about you. He said, if you oppress the widow and the orphan, and they cry unto me, I will hear their cry, and I will kill you with the sword. And your sons and daughters will be orphans, and your wife will be a widow You guys better watch out. That hand over your shoulder ain't me. It's going to be the living God hitting you in the head. I despise those people. They are scorpions. When a scorpion stings, it makes you numb. You get to staggering around and you don't know where you're going. and 
and you get to where you can't feel anything. I did a study on scorpions and what they did. They make you numb. You'll sit down anywhere. They, there's a drunkenness that overcomes you, and you don't know exactly where you're going, and your words are slurred, and nobody can understand you, and nothing's clear. That's what happens when a scorpion stings. I am here to fight and champion the poor and the downtrodden, and I despise those people that hurt the poor. And that's the greatest indictment that God brought against Israel. He said, you have oppressed the poor and the needy, and I won't put up with it. That's my poor and needy. If I could, I'd take those guys out and execute them. But God's going to execute them, and he's going to put them in hell one day. Oh, they sure do sound good, don't they? All they got's a bunch of cliches and catchphrases. They have no words of God. They are slick. They say nice sounding things that don't make any sense when you write it down on paper. <laughs> now look here. I want to show you that Paul mentions the scorpions and the bottomless pit without actually saying the terminology. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ into the doctrine of which is according to godliness. Paul actually mentions three things here. I forgot to give you one of them. What's coming up out of the bottomless pit? Let's go back over there before I read the next verse. <coughs> What's coming out of the pit? Smoke. Let's look at the smoke. Paul mentions the bottomless pit, the scorpions, and the smoke. Look here in Revelation 9. I want you to see this. And he opened the bottomless pit, verse 2, or the place of no knowledge, and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun, and the air was darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth unto them that was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. Now, locusts hurt the literal grass, don't they? Yes. Neither any green thing, locusts eat up all greenery. I saw a, a thing on TV about locust plagues. They showed these locusts, and they, somebody gave me this over here. Well, I, Thought I had it. Okay. There's a locust. And they said there were trillions of them. Trillions in a locust plague. And they stripped everything. Somebody gave it to me. It says Crouch on the back side there. <laughs> Paul Crouch. I keep saying, if locusts, if uh, these locusts or these scorpions or helicopters, when you get around Benny Hinn or Paul Crouch or Fred Price, Keep your head down because their blades are going to cut your head off. Because they are the scorpions. They're the false teachers. I have no use for those people. None. You say, you shouldn't talk about them. Won't you tell Jesus, Jesus that when he stood in the streets and looked at the Pharisees and said, You children of hell! He said, Your father's the devil. He was a liar and a murderer. And so are you. And they said, We'll kill you for that. And they did. Yeah, let me show you this. You got scorpions, bottomless pit, and smoke. I want you to see that Paul mentions all three of these here. We're already talking about the scorpions, which are false teachers, right? We're already talking about that. We've already concluded that. He says, This man that does not preach the doctrine which is according to God in this, he is proud. And let me get over here to smoke. The word proud is the word tufao. It means conceited. And they had a saying in that day and time. It meant to be slowly consumed by a smoke with no fire. Have you ever heard of somebody blowing smoke? 
That's what they're doing. They're blowing smoke. The word actually means to be consumed by smoke with no fire. It comes from the word T-U-P-H-L-O-S, to floss. That is the Greek word blind. Are these false teachers blinding people? Well, look here. Let's keep reading here. Let's keep reading. He is proud. Let me say the next words as though they came out of Revelation. He is proud in a bottomless pit. Bottomless pit means to know nothing, doesn't it? Paul says this man is proud. He's blowing smoke. And he knows nothing. Knows nothing is the definition of bottomless pit, isn't it? So Paul talks about scorpions or false teachers that know nothing. They come out of the bottomless pit and they're blowing smoke. All of this, these are pointers. That's what they are. Can you see that? Now, he says he's proud. He knows nothing. He dotes about questions and strifes of words. Boy, he don't want to get into word definition, does he? Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. We're talking about these false teachers, but look what they do. Perverse disputings of men. They are perverted in their minds. They say prosper means money. That's a lie. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. I like that word corrupt. Diaphothero. D-I-A. P-H-T-H-E-I-R-O. D-I-A. P-H. T-H-E-I-R-O. It means their understanding is thoroughly rotten. Their understanding is thoroughly rotten. These guys, these guys on TV, I watch them. I was watching TD Jakes before I came here. That guy's the slickest talking. He's got more cliches and catchphrases, and he says nothing. I mean absolutely zero. The two most two of the most dangerous of those people is TD Jakes and Rod Parsley. You know why? Because both of these guys know enough about the Bible to really slicker people. They know more than Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland is an imbecile when it comes to the Bible. Richard Roberts, to say he don't know anything is like saying a little kid that's in his diapers don't know nothing. Some of these guys are just morons. But Jake's is slick. He just says catchphrases. He was going across the floor and saying, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, you can get it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. Write that down. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. You can get it. You can get it. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, it sounds like you say no, I say yes. You say yes, I say no. Yeah, some old Beatles song. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Stupid. They are dangerous men. They are scorpions. They know nothing. But boy, they are seducing. They make it sound good. It's just, it's just a lie is what it is. You quit listening to the dynamics. Whoa, 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 come on, come on. Get away from that. I mean, if I said that enough, that'll wind you up, won't it? Give me a big microphone and let me scoot across the floor and go, whoa, whoa, yeah, you can get it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. What does that mean? That means absolutely zero. Just shut your mouth. Don't say nothing if you're going to say stupid things like that. And all that does is seduce people into saying, whoa, yeah, what makes me feel good? Yeah, he says I can do it. He says I can do it. Do what? You can get it. Get what? Does that, I mean, that enrages me because people are seduced by that trash. And it is trash. 
It's garbage. If you don't define things, most people that come here for six months say, Jim, my head's swimming, all this information, how am I ever going to learn it? I say, you may not ever learn it. That's why we give the gospel without charge. Our DVDs are free. You can have every week, every message I do. I want people to learn so they will not be seduced like they are. Don't you? I'm tired of the church being lied to and seduced. We are in the apostasy. And proof of it is these mega churches. They're not churches. Those aren't preachers. They're lying false teachers. They are wolves devouring the sheep. Let's see what else they do. They're destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness. What these guys do that have no knowledge, they're smoking people, they're scorpion, they're liars. All these are pointers that point to these guys. They, every one of these false teachers, they would have you believe that the more you have, the more godly you are. That means that Daniel was an ungodly man. Isaiah was an ungodly man. Paul was certainly an ungodly man because he was running for his life every day. Peter was an ungodly man. These men did not have money like they say. That means John the, John the Beloved on the Isle of Patmos that he was an ungodly man. He was poverty stricken. They suppose... Here's what's amazing about the scorpions. He said it was all vanity and vexation of spirit, didn't he? Here's what they do. They suppose, suppose that if you have lots of money or gain, they say that equals godliness. Is that what those guys say? Isn't that what... Isn't that what R.W. Wacko says, Shamba? They all say that. Suppose is the word nomidzo. Nomidzo is the verb form of a word. It's the verb form of the word nomos. Nomos. Nomos is the Greek word law. That word suppose means to legalize. They have legalized money as godly. They're liars. Now, I'm on TV in 39 cities, and I'm calling them liars looking right in the camera all the time. I don't know why one of them don't call me. Why don't you guys sue me? They don't want to go into court, say, now, Your Honor, and I'd like to say, Your Honor, now... The reason I'm calling them liars is because their criteria is the Bible. Now, can I bring my chalkboard in here and show you why they are liars? I want to use their book. I want to use their book and show why they are liars. Most of the courts would probably let me do that because most of the courts don't like those guys. But I'm too little of a man. I'm just not big enough in the world. I'm not damaging them enough. If I could damage him enough to have him come after me and file some big lawsuit, that would be the best advertisement we could have. Yeah. Yeah. Kenneth Copeland sues little predestination, no Christmas preacher down in <laughs> Hendersonville, Tennessee. <laughs> Thief. <laughs> crook. That's right. That's right. That's the only ones that they heard of the vessels of wrath. They can't hurt us. But one thing they will do, they'll seduce God's people for a while. The literal locusts destroy the greenery of the earth. But these are spiritual locusts. They're scorpions. And they only destroy. They just destroy the spiritual food. They destroy the word. Nomos is the word law. It means legal food for sheep. Legal food for animals. We are sheep. 
They destroy the law of God and they suppose that gain or money is godly. And these are the scorpions. What I'm trying to get at, keep in mind when you're reading in other parts of the Bible, Paul speaks of the scorpions, the bottomless pit, and the smoke without using the same terminology. Can you see that? Keep that in your mind. When you're studying anywhere in the Bible, keep concepts in your mind. You understand what I'm saying? Keep the concept there so that when you move into another area, you'll be able to see that. I mean, do you know that I have never heard another Bible teacher in America in my lifetime come up with what the scorpions are? And you know how easy I found it? Defined the word in the Greek and looked at the verb form and looked at all the places where the verb form is used. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. He that's not for me is against me, and the man that's against me scatters the sheep. The hireling allows the wolf to come in and scatter. Then you go over to Matthew 7, and a wolf is a false teacher. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. All you have to do is define, 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 define. Some guy walked up to me and said, or some guy called me and said, you sound like you read encyclopedias. I said, I certainly do. <laughs> what? It's like he thought that was an insult. You sound like you read encyclopedias. <laughs> like, that's some dirty thing. You should never read encyclopedias. Are you out of your mind? Certainly I read encyclopedias. All the time. All biblical encyclopedias and Jewish encyclopedias. It doesn't take a genius to do it. If you're going to spend $30,000, don't buy a new car. Buy you a library. I'll help you to pick out the books. And then enrich your mind. In five years, that $30,000 car is going to be worth $5,000. And your library is going to be here and it's going to be invaluable. If people studied, they could find out things. But they're, we're living like one guy was sitting watching TV with me one night. The house was watching a preacher. And he said, we're living in a world full of idiots, aren't we? I said, yeah, idiots. Nobody studies anything. They don't define anything. They don't care what anything means. Do they? But I want you... Huh? They have no knowledge. And the beast rose up. What's amazing... The beast comes up out of the bottomless pit. Doesn't it? But the beast... The beast with seven heads and ten horns comes up out of the bottomless pit or the place of no knowledge, doesn't it? In Revelation 11. The beast comes up out of the bottomless pit. Beast, out of the place of no knowledge. Well, what else does the Bible say the beast comes up out of? Out of the sea. Out of the sea. The beast was Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And I've mentioned this too, and I don't know if any of you caught it. Sometimes I'm going lickety-split. I'm kind of slowing down and talking to you tonight. Sometimes I'm going just rattling this stuff off, and I'm thinking, they're getting it. And I don't think everybody gets it. Yeah. The beast. How much time do I have, Mike? I got an old map. I drew this up myself. And here is... I drew this up a long time ago. I drew USSR up here. And there's Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, Turkey here. And here is uh, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, old ancient Persia, old Babylon. And here's Egypt. There's the Saudi Arabia. Here's the Sinai Peninsula here. And what I did, I got a map of the approximate boundaries of the beast. And I want to go ahead and say this again and say it quietly and say it gently so you can understand what I'm saying. I mean, I want to slow down when I say this. I want you to really understand this. The beast comes up out of the place of no knowledge. The beast... Babylon and Assyria carried Israel into captivity. 
the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, the Grecian leopard, and the Roman Empire, the beast with the iron teeth. Babylon and Assyria were identified with one another. The beast rises up out of the sea in Daniel 7, right? In Revelation 13 and 1, the beast rises up out of the sea. It's a lion, a bear, and a leopard. We know that that's Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, the beast with iron teeth. We know that. These are the approximate boundary lines of the beast rising up out of the sea. Here is the, the purple. That is the Assyrian Empire approximately right here. The green is Babylon. The green, that's approximate Babylonian Empire. And it went on back over here. It actually took in part of Persia over here. And then the Persian Empire is in the orange. The Persians overthrew the Babylonians. That's the bear. Here it goes back here like so. Persia was a large empire. No, Medes and Persia, yeah, but we just call it Persia for short right now. But the Grecian Empire is in the brown, right here, in the brown. Right here, going around Turkey, then back over here above, uh, above Iran, Iraq. And then you had the Roman Empire. And that's in the blue, coming over here and goes all the way over here. And the Romans were trying to conquer all the world. Nobody ever quite conquered all the world, if you notice. The beast rises up out of the sea, and the beast rises up out of the bottomless pit. The reason it says the beast rose up out of the sea is because the beast, or the world ruling system, always had its boundary lines up on the Mediterranean Sea. Now, let me ask you a question. How much knowledge of God did these people have when the beast rose up out of the sea? The beast rising up out of the sea is the same thing as the place of no knowledge because they had no knowledge of God. Why didn't they have knowledge of God? Well, they were fire and tree worshipers, weren't they? They were fire and tree worshipers. So coming up out of the sea... And out of the bottomless pit or the place of no knowledge is the same thing. Can you see what I'm saying? I've said that at 100 miles an hour in my teachings. And I never slow down to say, do you understand that? Can you see that? So the place of no knowledge is the sea. They didn't have any knowledge of God through these lands. The only people that had any knowledge of God was Israel, wasn't it? That's it. And now since nothing's changed, the beast has evolved into a worldwide system that has no knowledge of God. And we've went through the evolutionary process of the beast, haven't we? It evolved into Roman Catholicism, but Roman Catholicism has evolved into toleration and into political correctness, hasn't it? And let's all get along and hold hands. There's no knowledge of God going on in the world right now. You listen to these preachers, they have no knowledge of God. It is, and, but most people don't know that Catholicism is ruling. It is that edict of toleration that Constantine issued. Let's all get along. Let's mix truth and a lie throughout the world, Christianity and paganism. Let's have this mixture and everybody hold hands. He's a Baptist. He's a nice guy. He's a Catholic. He's a nice guy. He believes he gets to go to heaven. He's the church of Christ. He gets to dip in water and go to heaven. He has to eat Jesus to go to heaven. He has to accept Christ to go to heaven. And everybody, we're all going to get along. That's Catholicism. It's smoke. Thank you. It's blowing smoke. Y'all realize the trouble that America is in? We are living in insanity. I have spent 51 years studying the Bible. No small amount of time, my wife will tell you. I stay in a mode, study mode around the clock. Looked up things. I've spent some decades. I've spent 
30, 35 hours a week studying like a man would go to work. And through all of this, I'm really, really realizing how little I know. But the thing that's really registering on me, the world's in trouble. We don't have any preachers that know nothing. Billy Graham is as dumb as a tractor seat. Did you know that? He knows nothing about the Bible. Well, he is, isn't he? The man knows. When you start telling people, you start telling people, if you don't have a daily cross, you are not a follower of Jesus. I didn't say that. Jesus said in Luke 14, 27, if you do not bear your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Do you hear preachers saying that? That's Jesus' words. If you do not forsake all that you have, you cannot be a follower of Christ. You have to forsake everything. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Do preachers say that? Jesus said in Luke 14, 33, If you do not forsake all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. You know what? That's as hard a word as you can say. Isn't it? That's like getting hit in the head with a truck, isn't it? And Jesus said, if the world hated me, it'll hate you. If it persecuted me, it'll persecute you. Go and tell somebody. If you are a Christian, you must be hated for righteousness' sake. And if you're not hated, you're not a believer. Tell somebody that. Say, when's the last time a preacher told you that? I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Anyone who don't say that is a false teacher. He's a liar. But these guys are popular, aren't they? The world likes them. They're nice guys. That's an indictment about their unbelief. Whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. If you're friends with the world and the world likes you and you can get the vote, you are in trouble with God. If you are Billy Graham, you are in trouble. He's the most popular preacher in the last thousand years. I would hate for that to be said about me. Because Jesus said we have to be infamous, not famous. In a favorite verse, James 4 and 4. You don't hear preachers preach on James 4 and 4. You adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that friendship with the world is enmity against God? Ekther is the word enmity. It means hostile. E-C-H-T-H-R-A. Extra hostile. If you are friends with the world, if you are philia, affectionate, if the world has an affection for you and you go out and you can get the vote and be elected mayor or governor or president or superstar or big preacher at some big convention, you are God's enemy. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? And they want to get mad at me for saying that. Mister, that's your problem with God when the judgment comes. I wouldn't be Billy Graham for all the money in the world. I would not trade places with Charles Stanley for any amount of money. I would not trade the understanding that I have about Scripture and I give God the glory for that. I would not trade that for all the money that Bill Gates has got. Bill Gates is going to go to hell one day. People say, how do you know that? You can't... Well, has you ever heard him talking about a daily cross and death to self and self-denial? I don't think so. No siree. Have I got any time left? About a minute. I hope you can see, once you get a hold of the pointers, you say, Jim, how can I find out what these things mean? Get... Uh, if you can find some McClinic and Strong, these are fantastic. Buy all the books you can on culture and customs and idioms and metaphors. Take your concordance, and when you're looking up Scorpion, look up in your concordance, Scorpion, and look up every time it's mentioned, and go read every verse. And it'll tell you what a scorpion is in the Old Testament. That's what's amazing to me. When you define the word and you get the verb and you get the noun and the verb is to scatter abroad and you're going, oh me, that's false teachers. It's not helicopters. I want you to learn. If I've emphasized anything tonight, it is, first of all, 
If you don't know what a tire is or what a good year is, it ain't going to help you to drive up and down the road. If all you speak is German and you're running up and down the road looking at these signs that says Goodyear and Firestone, it ain't going to do you any good. Is it? You're going to have to learn to speak English. And you know what you're going to have to do? Learn to speak in first century understanding. You're going to have to define everything you run across. We have defined every, well, nearly every major word in the book of Revelation. We've defined nearly every word. And without defining it, you can't understand. You're not going to know what it's pointing at, are you? But you know what? That's true of everything in the Bible. We can't trust these translators, and you can't trust a word when you see it. How many idioms do we have? I sat and wrote a list one night with idioms. I got a frog in my throat. Can y'all see? There's this little amphibian. See? I don't have a literal frog in my throat. Got a monkey on my back. That don't. What does that mean? Huh? Yeah, I got a little horse. Uh, just think of all the idioms. Sit down and write all the idioms. You'll say, well, why do they talk that way? Why do you talk the way you talk? Pick up somebody out of the first century. Teach them English. But don't teach them the idioms and metaphors and start saying these things to them. They're going, what? What do you mean? We use idioms all day long, and so did they. Metaphoric language. Without defining it, you're not going to understand the pointer. Mary says to me sometimes, she says, sometimes I don't understand that. I want to really emphasize this for her. You'll understand if you find out what the pointer means. But if you don't understand the language, you can't understand the pointer, can you? If you don't speak English... Say, let's go down the street and get some hamburgers. You say it in German. You drive down the street and you don't recognize a hamburger joint. Because you can't read hamburger. It's not going to help you. If you can't read scorpion and know that they meant a false teacher, you're just lost, aren't you? Yeah, they think they're helicopters. I'm out of time. I, I didn't even get back to a lot of the things I want to get to. But I really want to emphasize, learn, when you learn something in one section of the Scripture, just like Paul, Paul explains the false teachers in the bottomless pit and smoke, doesn't he? And the smoke would block the sun. The smoke is a picture and a type of these, these trillions of locusts that would block the light of the sun. And these false teachers, scorpions, are blocking the light they would actually, it would be just dark under these, under these locusts and they were blocking the light and the false teachers are blocking the spiritual light. Yeah. And they're blinding people to the truth or blinding people to the light. Huh? Well, I'm out of time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Help us to learn to understand these pointers. That you're pointing out things to us so that we can see exactly what you mean. But Lord, you're only revealing these deep things to us. But Lord, we can't be lazy when we're finding out what they mean. Help us to see and grasp these things. Help the people here to learn to study for themselves. So they can see what the scripture's pointing to. God will continue to praise you and give you glory for everything. Crush us under your hand. Give us strength and courage to continue this work. Leads to the elect. Fight our battles. Manipulate our minds and our hearts that will do the things you'd have us to do. And we'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I was going somewhere else, but I didn't go there. I didn't go there. We'll come back and see us, okay? Come back.